The religion of the ethical spirit is, however, its elevation above its real world, the withdrawal from its truth into the pure knowledge of itself. Since the ethical nation lives in immediate unity with its substance and lacks the principle of the pure individuality of self-consciousness, the complete form of its religion first appears as divorced from its existential shape. For the reality of the ethical substance rests partly on its passive unchangeableness as contrasted with the absolute movement of self-consciousness and consequently on the fact that this self-consciousness has not yet withdrawn into itself from its contented acceptance of custom and its firm trust therein. Partly, too, on its organization into a multiplicity of rights and duties, as also on its distribution into the spheres of the various classes and their particular activities which cooperate to form the whole, and hence on the fact that the individual is content with the limitation of his existence and has not yet grasped the unrestricted thought of his free self. But that tranquil immediate trust in the substance turns back into trust into one, in oneself and into the certainty of oneself. And the multiplicity of rights and duties, like the restricted activity, is the same dialectical movement of the ethical sphere as the multiplicity of things and their specific natures. A movement which finds its rest and stability only in the simplicity of the spirit that is certain of itself. The consummation of the ethical sphere in free self-consciousness and the fate of the ethical world are therefore the individuality that has withdrawn into itself, the absolute levity of the ethical spirit which has dissolved within itself all the firmly established distinctions of its stable existence and the spheres of its organically ordered world and being perfectly sure of itself has attained to unrestrained joyfulness and the freest enjoyment of itself. This simple certainty of spirit within itself has a twofold meaning. It is a serene, stable existence and settled truth and also absolute unrest in the passing away of the ethical order. But it changes round into the latter, for the truth of the ethical spirit is, in the first instance, still only this substantial essence and trust in it, in which the self does not know itself as a free individuality, and which therefore in this inwardness or in the liberation of the self perishes. Since then, its trust is broken and the substance of the nation bruised, spirit which hitherto mediated the unstable extremes has now stepped forth as an extreme that of self-consciousness grasping itself as essence. This is spirit, inwardly sure of itself, which mourns over the loss of its world and now out of the purity of self creates its own essence, which is raised above the real world. Paragraph 701 is a pretty long and dense paragraph. There's a lot going on in this. Hegel actually uses the word dialectic at one point, and I think we can say that that's what's happening throughout this entire paragraph. A lot of the features of the Hegelian dialectic, and by that I mean the real Hegelian dialectic, not that silly nonsense that people turn into memes with, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is actually, this is the real dialectic right here that we're getting to see. And it's, it's uh, touching on something that's really at the heart of the Hegelian project overall and in the phenomenology, the ethical substance, the entirety of the phenomenology, you could say, is not just like a record of where spirit has been and, you know, sort of like a mausoleum or a museum with things that we are now, you know, allowed to see exhibits of, right? It's supposed to be practical. There's a development that we are going along with in part so we can identify what's, what's like this in the world for us. Now, this is about ancient Greek religion, that is the free people that Hegel has in mind here. And I, I guess you could also say by extension, you know, the larger Greek influenced world of the 
Romans as well. And, you know, we might extend this to the entire sphere of the Mediterranean and the Middle East that is, is connected with Greek culture, you know, all the way to, to India uh, and mixing in other things as well. Although Hegel doesn't have, you know, a really great conception of this as, as we do today. He's working with, you could say, less uh, less ethnographic studies, less history, less things like that. And he's got to put it together. And, and he is very centered on the Greeks. He talks here about the religion of the ethical spirit. What is the religion of the ethical spirit? What we've seen developed in the last two paragraphs where we've gone from the worker and you know statuary or architecture or stuff like that to this belonging to a people and not just any people, not just replicating restless, antagonistic, you know, Fulker fighting each other, but a, a sphere of freedom. This is really quite central for Hegel. The entire phenomenology is, is, becomes much more clear in the reason and spirit and religion and absolute knowing section is oriented towards towards freedom, and that is what Hegel thinks history is a working out of. I mean, there's other themes involved as well. It's not just freedom all the time, but that's, that's quite central. So he says, the religion of the, the ethical spirit is its elevation above, now he doesn't say the real world, right? And what he's talking about there, what's being translated as real world, wirklichkeit, actuality, reality. It's reality which may not be the same as reality per se, but it, it, a reality that it itself has to deal with and project out there onto things. So he says, it's an elevation above its real world, the withdrawal from its truth into the pure knowledge of itself. And this is the starting point of the paragraph. This is really what is happening throughout the entire paragraph and this rather abstract formulation that we, you know, we've seen Hegel say stuff like this all the time, pure knowledge of itself, right? Um, the pure knowledge of itself is not going to turn out to be quite so pure, and it's not going to be solely of itself, but it is going to be, you know, spirit is centered upon itself in making sense out of itself in religion. So he goes on and he says, the ethical nation lives in immediate unity with its substance, right? What does that mean? Immediate, un unmediated, right? The ethical uh, substance is what the, the nation is living in continuity with. They are not exactly identical, but they are certainly, we could say, overlapping at, at multiple points, right? The ethical nation lives in its own ongoing, immediate, unmediated unity. And then here he says, and lacks the principle of the pure individuality of self-consciousness. Here we got to be a little bit careful. It, Hegel doesn't say just that it lacks the principle of the pure individuality of self-consciousness. He actually, in the German, says that the the um, ethical nation doesn't have this within it. So yes, it does technically lack it, but it's going to have it brought back within it, and that's going to transform it as individuality becomes something really central here, so, something driving, the, the, you might say, the, the tool, the vehicle of spirit. So he, he goes on and he says, because these are the case, the ethical nation is in immediate unity, lacks this principle, the complete form of its religion first appears as divorced from its existential shape, its bestehen, right, how, how it is in there. So its complete form of religion appears as separated from this. And he goes on and he says, the reality of the ethical substance, so the reality, the wirklichkeit, of this ethical substance rests, and here he goes, partly on this, partly on this. So we got to look at both sides of this partly, or on the one hand, on the other hand. How do we, how do we uh, unpack that? So we have what we can call passive unchangeableness, right? Ruhige, restful, you know, 
Um, and then we have the organization, and, and Hegel actually uses the term organization here, as we've seen him do in the previous paragraphs at different points and throughout the phenomenology. He'll use Latinate forms rather than German forms every once in a while. The organization into multiplicity, field height, right? Differentiation. Um, a, a, I mean, you could say mul multiplicity unfolding, right, if we want to play on that idea. So both of these are, are important, right? Both of these are what the ethical substance in its Wirklichkeit, in its reality, in its being in the world rests upon. He says it, it rests partly on its passable, passive unchangeableness as contrasted with the absolute movement of self-consciousness, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a, already a differentiation taking place here. And then he goes on and he says, consequently, on the fact that this self-consciousness has not yet withdrawn into itself from its contented acceptance of custom and its, fear, its uh, uh, firm trust therein. Now, what is custom? Zitta, right? So we're playing off of this factor that we've already talked about. Um, ethical, you know, zitliche is coming from zitta, which, you know, I'm going to go on a little bit of a digression here. People always want to contrast morality and ethics. And, they're, you know, one is coming from Latin terms. One is coming from Greek terms. Uh, mores are the same thing as ethe, you know, the customs, the norms, right? One is Latin, one is Greek. And so what we're talking about here is not some sort of ethics like what we get in a textbook where we say, well, there are three main kinds of ethics. There's consequentialist ethics, uh, best represented by utilitarianism. There's deontological ethics, which is best represented by Immanuel Kant or maybe, you know, uh, W.D. Ross and, and Robert Audi's intuitionism. And then there's virtue ethics, and we're not quite sure where to put that. And then we've also got feminist ethics. Okay, that, that's, that's nice. That, that's all real stuff. But that's not what Hegel means here. <laughs> he doesn't mean people whipping out a, a book and consulting it. And, I mean, they may have it like stored away in their head with a bunch of you know, injunctions, but it's not some systematized, based on principles that should be immediately in, evident to all rational beings kind of ethics that we're used to, right? This is uh, kind of commonsensical every day, uh, learning from your, your parents and your predecessors and your educators and whoever else, um, sometimes in the school of hard knocks, the way things go, the way things ought to go, you know, looking at what's socially disapproved, what's approved, even if it's not always coherent. Well, that is part of the, the ethical substance. And those are these customs in which one has trust as, as an individual, right? Each individual doesn't have to make it up all by themselves, thank God, and, you know, because you'd never get anywhere. Uh, the people who think they are going to make it up all by themselves, you've you got to watch out for those, those types, actually. So that's the passive unchangeableness side. Then it gets even more interesting. Because what else does Hegel say is involved in the ethical substance? Well, there's a differentiation, right? Organization in multiplicity or in, you know, a, a diversity, we could also say, of different people and not just individual people, but all sorts of factors that, that, are, that are coming together, that are overlapping with each other. That's part of what makes it an organization. So he says, here we go, um, partly to on its organization into a multiplicity of rights and duties, right? So that's, that's seemingly applying to the whole set of individuals. Not everybody necessarily has all the same rights or the same duties, but everybody's got some of them, right? And, and you, you have to live them out. That defines you as an ethical person, um, ethically good or ethically bad, right? Or whatever other qualities we want to uh, signify in this. Not only do we have individuals with rights and duties, but we also, he says, 
uh, on its distribution into the spheres, the massen, the, the masses of the, the various classes, stände. This is a very important idea for Hegel. He doesn't want a society in the end where everybody is exactly on you know the same level all the time. He actually does think that there's some usefulness in having social classes with different functions or as it's going to be called here, particular activities, um, besondere uh, tuns, right? Tuns are deeds or actions. He could have used the word handeln there as well, particular comportments, the things that they, they do. So all of this is, is a part of the reality of ethical substance. And, you know, if you observe a city that you live within, uh, you know, as, as morning dawns and all this, the activities start happening, um, you can get some sense of that. You look at a working farm, you look at uh, all, all the ways in which we administer or fail to administer justice. Those are all parts of, of this ethical substance. The storytellers that are reinforcing or challenging moral norms or screwing them up, you know, making them superficial or uh, making the, the really important questions come out. That's all part of this as well. So he goes on and he says that these, these cooperate to form the whole. And then he says, hence on the fact that the individual is content. All right, so the individual, we come back to the self-consciousness that is not withdrawn into itself and that is, um, you know, it's got these these custom and this trust going on. So the individual is content with limitation, with beschränkung, um, you know, being closed in into something that is being provided by this, we might call it blueprint for how things are supposed to go in society. Oh, you're a carpenter? Great. You do some carpentry. And you also, you know, when it's festival time, behave in this way and you contribute a little bit of tax to this. And like a good person, when you see a crime being report, crime happening, you report the crime, but you don't take action on it necessarily yourself because maybe there's the city archons, the rulers that will take care of that. So the individual is content with their own limitation in this, this sense, he says, right? the limitation of their existence, and they have not yet grasped the unrestricted thought of their free self. Now, at any moment, somebody could realize this free self, that the mores are kind of arbitrary. They've been around for a long time, or they've been recently you know, instituted, but they are not necessarily the best way of doing things. Anybody at any point in time could be like, wait a second, this isn't, this isn't necessarily the way things have to go, but that's not happening yet at this point. So he goes on and he says, this tranquil, immediate trust in the substance turns back into, here's where it gets very interesting, trust in oneself and into the certainty, gewissheit, of one's own self. Now, where did we see this certainty of oneself? Well, at a number of different points, the most recent of which was conscience, right? Uh, back in the morality section. And that led into all sorts of quandaries. It wasn't quite so easy to determine. It's not like you just have the light bulb go on in your head. Oh, conscience, I can think of everything, the whole thing for myself. I don't need all of this baggage. Well, you actually do need that baggage. But... Which baggage do you need? <laughs> you don't need all of it necessarily. So he goes on and he says, um, the multiplicity of rights and duties, like the restricted activity of the individual, is the same dialectical movement of the ethical sphere as the multiplicity. Now here, notice what he says here. The multiplicity of things, dinga, not persons, things. How did persons turn into things? They can be objectified, right? Or we can think of a person maybe just in terms of their functions. And then specific natures translate here, translates here, bestimmungen. And these apply to the things, right? We could say determinations as well. The thing and its determinations. But it's not the thing. It's the whole bunch of things. We might see this as sort of like the corollary of the personal and class-based, function-based 
uh, involvement of the ethical substance here. So we have a kind of maybe materialization, we could say, of, of this going on as well. So we're getting a richer and richer world, richer and richer environment for spirit on its little trajectory here, aren't we? He goes on and he says, the multiplicity of these rights and duties is the same dialectical movement as the multiplicity of things, their specific natures, a movement which finds its rest and stability only in the simplicity of the spirit that is certain of itself. Now, who, what simplicity of the spirit certain of itself is ethical substance providing that? No, it's it, now we come back to the individual, right? And we get individuality withdrawn into itself. So he says, the consummation of the ethical sphere in free self-consciousness and the fate of the ethical world, so this is pretty important stuff here, right? Or what? The individuality, Einzelnheit, that is withdrawn into itself. Here, Hegel uses three terms that I really wanted to signal because they establish a mood or a set of interlocking moods for what's happening. And there's kind of a duplicity going on here, which I'll signal in just a moment. So he says, um, here we go. He, this individuality that is withdrawn into itself, which is now spirit, the absolute levity of the ethical spirit, spirit which is dissolved within itself, all the firmly established distinctions of its stable existence, all the spheres of its organically ordered world, right? This levity, like Zin. Right? And then we have what else has attained to an unrestrained, unbeschrankte, right? Not not being limited, not being confined, joyfulness, Freudigkeit, and he says uh, the freest enjoyment of itself. Not not just enjoyment of you know whatever's out there to take satisfaction in, eat it up, you know. Uh, watch some TV, screw around, you know, get drunk or something like that. Enjoyment of itself. So we have levity, joyfulness, enjoyment. This is really, you know, if this was music, it'd be very cheerful, triumphant, major mode kind of stuff. Getting it from maybe, Be not Beethoven, but Mozart, you know, or somebody like that. Now, that's, that's only one side of the story, but that, uh, we don't want to leave that out. That, that is quite important. So he goes on and he says, the simple certainty of spirit within itself has a twofold meaning. So there's two sides to this, right? It is a serene, stable existence and settled truth on the one hand, absolute unrest in the passing away of the ethical order on the other hand. Well, that sounds pretty bad. Do we want the ethical order to pass away? Um, can it be taken up into this, this moment of enjoyment and the individuality? Can, can that bear the weight of what the ethical order was providing? Something that we, in fact, desire. We desire as self-consciousnesses. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. As self-consciousnesses, we don't just desire the desire of the other or recognition or acknowledgement of the other, a single person. We desire recognition, acknowledgement, being told we matter to the ethical substance. And, and many of us never get that, right? We often live in societies that are alienated and alienating but that doesn't mean that we don't desire it, that we don't want it, that we're not seeking it, even if we can't get it. And it could also be within the scope of smaller institutions, you know, uh, workplaces, families, all, all those sorts of things as well. Even maybe, to, you know, today in our online setting, online in platforms, people seeking out that. So this is a, this is a really important turning point. He goes on and he says, it changes round into the ladder. What's the ladder? The passing away of the ethical order. The truth of the ethical spirit is, in the first instance, still only this substantial essence and trust in it, in which the self does not know itself as a free individuality. Right. So that's, that's our starting point. That's what we're coming back to. And he says, um, 
and which therefore in this inwardness or the liberation of the self perishes. So it seems like insofar as we get away from this trust in the mores or the, you know, the ethe, the moral norms, the, the customs, the ordering of things, finding our own place. As we break free from that through exercising our rational faculties and living a life, practical action, we don't just have this happiness, we also have estrangement or alienation. We also have what he's going to call here grief or sorrow taking place as well. Why? Because he says um, the trust is broken. The substance of the nation bruised. Now, who is the, who's the substance of the nation bruised by? Is it just sort of some random thing? Oh, it's too bad. Things didn't work out. No, the, the individuality who is stripping themselves out of the ethical substance and pursuing something in addition to it, pursuing, remember that, that what was not in the ethical substance, this principle of free individuality, that does exist, that's out there. It shows that the ethical substance, the community does not contain the whole, and it, it is bruised, it's, it's you know, damaged, it's you know, shown as insufficient as a result, but it's still there, it's still wounded, it's still you know, going on, just as much as you know, when you go off to wherever you're, you're going in, in your life as an adolescent, and you, you know, could be the army, could be college, could be you know, moving out and getting a job and having your own stuff, your family's still behind you, you know, and maybe they still want you to be that, that kid who you were, or maybe they're more mature and can recognize that you're growing up, or they're somewhere in between, and they, they want something back from you. They want to reconnect with you, unless they're a bunch of jerks, in which case, maybe good riddance. Let's go on. So he says, the trust is broken, the substance of the nation bruised, Spirit, <clears throat> which hitherto mediated the unstable extremes. What are the unstable extremes? Ethical substance, individuality, has now stepped forth as an extreme. Spirit is now on the side of the self-consciousness grasping itself as essence. And so he says, this is spirit, inwardly sure of itself, which, which mourns over the loss of its world. And now out of the purity of self creates its own essence, which is raised above the real world, the Wirklichkeit, right? So, you know, this is, this is a, a passage that contains joy and, and sorrow, um, lightness and grief. We might say to, you know, paraphrase both Spinoza and Lev Shestov, uh, laughing and weeping, right? Although Hegel's not using those terms here, but we have these modalities, very interesting emotional modalities coming into play here as well. So a lot going on in this, and you could think of this as a circular movement that's taking place, which is going to be affecting the ethical substance. Now, we've gotten kind of far away from art and from religion, haven't we, in this, this paragraph. We've talked a lot about ethics, we've talked a lot about self-consciousness, we've talked a lot about rights and duties and, you know, the, the world of things. How are we going to get back now into talking about religion and religion, particularly in terms of the, the artwork and the artificer, now an artist? Well, that's, that's coming in, in the following paragraphs.